Hello my soccer universe, this is the last video of the year where I just wanna let the moments of the year that moved my soccer universe uh, wanna look back at them, put them in perspective, put a little bit of a ranking in there uh, this year maybe it's a little bit more than it has been in previous years because there is for me a very very clear number one you may take a guess already um, but other than that, uh, it is going to be a fun review of what the year was. I have here in the background, there are a few teams that we will be talking about uh, during this video. There will be a few wardrobe changes as well. But before we look back on what was on the pitch, I also want to quickly review uh, the year for the channel where uh, it was pretty much a marquee year in the sense I have crossed the 1000 subscriber mark uh, on my last vacation <laughs> the day at the beach which was pretty awesome I have, have, to, have to say and thanks to you I have achieved this one because you enjoy what I'm doing you are watching you are subscribing and you cannot I cannot tell you how much this means to me personally uh, and to top it all off I even got a not not notification that for the first time ever, I will actually make a little bit of money, a little bit of uh, my venture here. So, which was never the goal, but it's an added benefit that honestly, I have to tell you, um, turning my passion in a little bit of a reward, that is awesome too, I have to say. And for that, let me now thank you a whole lot for all this. Now in this video, as you can see the storylines, story I'm wearing a Lask jersey. There's really not much uh, that I can say about Lask, but I said, you know, it is my hometown team. It is the team that I uh, support the most. Their year in review, it was a horrible uh, spring. It has been a pretty good start to the season. Uh, things look much, much better, however. The biggest news and there's once I will mention them in the countdown but there's one big um, silver lining on the horizon that's of course the new stadium is being built and you know I'm living on the hill above the town so every time I, I go down I can actually see the stadium being built you see it now it is a proper stadium this will be probably one of the most exciting moments for the upcoming year but enough of the past uh, of the upcoming year and me talking about myself let's talk about what happened this year what are the moments that moved me personally and we'll start off with it has been a remarkable a year for english club football and there would be so many things to choose from we actually we had a title race that was really really enthralling we had liverpool uh, playing every possible game this season all the way in the running for four titles they got two the two cups uh, lost the Champions League final and lost on the last day against City in the title fight where on, on honestly all the points were pointed to, uh, to City we also have now in the um, current season the amazing run that Arsenal is on on potentially on its way of dethroning city we gotta see about that however it's also this season that i think the most remarkable story to me is erling holland running riot through the premier league we knew that he's a great goal scorer he has scored his goals in austria he did it in the champions league for salzburg he went to dortmund immediately made an impact was unfortunately in injured and you know you could also see that he may not be uh, the striker that put them ahead of Bayern, but he was a lethal striker. However, if you put one of the biggest young talents together with one of the, with the best squad in Europe, the result is amazing. He is on par to score more than 50 goals. He already has scored more than 20 and it's just past Christmas, which never has happened before. He would have won the scoring title already in previous seasons. And for me, one of some of the worst takes of this year and what makes this even more uh, exciting in a way is that so many naysayers, especially after the Community Shield said, nah, he's not, he will have to adapt to the Premier League. 
boy did he take time adapting he took no time adapting and it got a little bit quiet around the world cup because Norway didn't qualify it sure made sure that we'll still be talking about scoring against liverpool almost immediately and then two more now as well uh in the league it is just he is on fire he's probably at the moment the most exciting player uh, around to watch and it actually makes watching city games worthwhile because you have this additional extra in there and so for me it should be all about him let's see where the season will go if he can stay healthy it really was a great year for africa as well and one that i did not see it coming of course i've been looking forward to the afcon because that's a tournament that I absolutely love and adore. You don't necessarily watch it for the great soccer that's being played there, because let's face it, most of the time it is not great. But it's just a glimpse in a different world, in a world that seems to be long gone by in many ways. So yeah, in Cameroon, we had in January and early February, we had the AFCON and it was a really, really interesting to me with a few upsets remember Comoros beating Ghana uh, and then uh, having to play with a goalkeeper that was actually an outfield player who actually played quite well against Cameroon that was one of those stories uh, it was also a tournament uh, that had quite a few upsets uh, we had quite some interesting games we had of course the great final between uh, Senegal and Egypt, where Egypt just had ousted the hosts. And it was basically a li an internal Liverpool duel between Mohamed Salah and Sadio Mane. Uh, it wasn't the greatest of finals, but the climax that it came to a penalty shooter with Sadio Mane uh, converting just made it all the more worthwhile. And finally, Senegal have their title. They have been uh, really wanting for years. They lost previous finals they have been uh, favorites for quite quite a while this was their crowning achievement overall so and then we're not done yet then it continued into the world cup qualifying playoffs which were just absolute madness and it was during the afcon that they determined the pairings and again it was a replay of the afcon final and i have, have to say i think um the uh, african federation should rethink how they do this uh the qualifying whether it isn't better to have five groups that where one goes on because the playoff was brutal for africa because you lost some of the biggest teams there you lost egypt who came in with an advantage from the first leg then senegal quickly equalized and then it went all the way to a dramatic penalty shoot away again Sergio Manet sent senegal through uh, double whammy for Egypt right there and one of the best teams in Africa did not make it another two other great teams did not make it we had Ghana who had been completely humiliated at the AFCON beating Nigeria out of nowhere a game that they literally had almost no business winning they came through and won that game and then the drama around Algeria, who already were eliminated the AFCON group stage, but still were considered the strong side. They came into the AFCON as one of the strongest teams ever. They had a record-winning streak that they could have uh, uh, they could have broken Italy's streak. They look good for most of the time against Cameroon, and then they lose more or less on the last shot in overtime in a super super dramatic fashion. This was something that had not been seen because uh, Cameron, yes, made a third place, but never looked com convincing. So that was really, really good to, uh, really, really exciting to see. Although I think that African teams could have performed even better if they would have actually had the strongest team like Algeria and Nigeria there. Still, African teams, and I did not expect it, did really, really well at this World Cup. The two teams that I would have seen that could have made it through, despite Sergio Mane not playing for Senegal, Senegal made it out of the group, which was semi-expected uh, in there. Morocco, I could see coming, and if you watch my World Cup preview, I saw that Morocco could do something, but that they make it uh, into the semi-finals, I never saw that coming. And on the cherry on top is that all African teams made it to the World Cup with African coaches. They were all coached by African coaches, which I think shows 
that there is finally some movement in Africa to relying on their own coaches and that was great to see. So really, really happy for what happened in Africa. Um, again, Senegal probably the biggest story, but Morocco takes a very, very close second, deservedly so. It was also a great year for the women's games. Yes, England can actually win an international title at the senior level. We had the women's Euros in England uh, with Spain probably the best team, but receiving really rough news that their best players, are, uh, especially Puteas, not being able to play at the tournament, which kind of opened the door for um, England, who were coached by Sarina Wichmann, who not only got the Netherlands the 2017 title, but also got them to 2019 World Cup final. So, uh, and she had been unbeaten. And England romped more or less through the group stage. Um, although they had some hard time in the open against Austria, and more on my Austrian women a little, a little bit later, then they had a really tough time against the Spanish team that still was good. But I uh, had to uh, go uh, get past them. And then they made it all the way to the final. I think in the semi-final, I don't remember. Uh, there was a great goal scored against Sweden. Uh, <laughs> and then the final, I mean, Germany was the other great team in the tournament, uh, one has to say. And it was a worthy final. The only downside to me is that England probably should have played in the red against Germany in white. Um, that's how it should be. However, they played in the other colors where in the end Germany uh, they could draw level they probably found themselves aggrieved that some refereeing decisions did not go their way but in the end uh, to a great goal that gave England the lead and then a stoppage time goal saw so England win the Euros on home soil football was coming home in a way it was also great for the Austrian women who survived the group stage with England and Norway uh, which was not entirely expected. They confirmed what they showed in 2017 and then had a rather unlucky loss, typically Austrian way, an unlucky loss to Germany. How it ended on a sour note by not qualifying for the World Cup, which will happen next year, um, losing to Scotland in a playoff, which was not expected and left the year a little bit with a sour taste for one where you could have actually looked very positively on it. UEFA's lesser com club competitions you usually get short shrift by especially the English speaking media but I gotta say I really really enjoyed the initial Europa Conference League uh, there were some really great games in there it was also the one point where especially in the um, uh, spring Lask actually shone a little bit yes they were eliminated by Slavia Prague deservedly so um, but they left the competition by winning a game, the return game, they lost the first leg 4-1. They won it 4-3 after being 3-1 down, Slavia with nine, with nine men only. So, you know, it was a little bit, but at least it was a positive trend and you got some points for uh, the five-year ranking there as well. So this was a little bit, yeah, Lask, very good. However, it was Roma's comp competition. But I want to also point, point out this comp competition has some really interesting ties we had a uh, Leicester against PSV matchup that was really, really tight and uh, was won then by PSV. I think in Leicester they turned the game around. We had uh, Roma against Bode Glimt who had beaten them. They made it through there. We had Feyenoord against Slavia, an absolute crazy game. The semi-final between Marseille and um, Feyenoord was great. We had also Pauk, should have mentioned, should of course match them making it into the quarterfinal there. So really, really great stuff. The final though between Roma and Feyenoord was more of an Italian affair where Roma used the one weakness of Feyenoord who then stormed back to take a lead through Zaniolo. And unfortunately, my guy Gernot Trauner made the crucial mistake there. So there was a little bit, little bit down, but on the other side, I always supported Roma and I was not unhappy that Roma won that final. And it ended with Jose Mourinho being able to claim that he's the only coach in the entire world who has won three European trophies. It was a great start to that competition. I personally think though that the Europa League was probably the most exciting competition of all the European club competitions. 
because we got a final that no one expected beforehand between Eintracht Frankfurt and Glasgow Rangers. Or Rangers, I should, I should say. In Austria, we say Glasgow Rangers uh, to distinguish them. Um, which was, in, in a way, the two teams that get the most traveling support. Uh, Frankfurt fans, again, made their presence felt especially on that uh, Easter weekend Thursday uh, where they went to Barcelona and at least half of the stadium were, was full with Frankfurt fans and then Frankfurt played up to their billing and eliminated Barcelona having a 3-0 lead and for me this was the first time where I actually really supported a German team in any European competition for the simple reason that the coach of Frankfurt is former Lask coach uh, Oliver Glasner, who of course has, has also as a player close ties with the local rival uh, Reed, closer to where he grew up with. Um, in, but uh, that this guy who got Lask out of nowhere into the second place in Austria and then moving on to Germany, being successful in Wolfsburg and now winning the Europa League with Frankfurt, that is an amazing, amazing, amazing story. Of course, I have at least one friend, no, I have two or three friends who are Rangers fans. Uh, they were not very happy with, with that, but for me, this personal connection definitely took center stage there. But uh, the, it was not only the uh, Barcelona Frankfurt game, we had, of course, uh, Rangers, the fight backs against Dortmund, which were absolutely crazy. We had Rangers against Leipzig, another absolute of a crazy game. We had Frankfurt going to West Ham and uh, causing um, them trouble, where actually West Ham fans were really looking forward to making it to a European final. There were so many great storylines in that competition that it was truly, truly enjoyable. Uh, it didn't maybe have always the high class that we expect from a European competition, but there was definitely drama and definitely many, many goals being scored. So yeah, Frankfurt winning the Europa League is probably one of the biggest stories, at least here in the German speaking world. However, as great as the runs by Roma and Frankfurt were, I think Real Madrid takes the title for the most impressive run to a European title and I have heard Real Madrid described as the most undeserving champion of all time and I want to argue against it because they beat every single top team in Europe they did not take the easy route this was not a Real Madrid title as when they had the three consecutive ones in a row where you actually thought yeah uh, the draw always fell in their way absolutely not this time around Real Madrid had to make it the hard way. Remember the draw that had to be retaken where they first got Benfica? That would have been Real Madrid. No, they got PSG. They got outplayed by PSG in the first leg where Angelotti just parked the bus and was almost sacked because Mbappé scores a very late winner after Messi missed a penalty. They find themselves down. It was totally Mbappé show at the Bernabeu at a time when Mbappé was about to move to Real Madrid. More on that in a little bit. Um, but that was just remarkable to see. But then, in addition, uh, out of nowhere, Karim Benzema scores a goal. He gets a second goal. And then suddenly PSG fall apart. Then they play Chelsea in the next round. A uh, re uh, re replay from a semifinal just, uh, uh, just a, a year prior. Outplayed Chelsea in the first half, but Chelsea actually had enough fight back quality to, to make it competitive. And then in Madrid, Chelsea are the better team for most of the time. However, Real Madrid just managed to get the crucial goal. And again, wonderful Modric pass on that. And then in overtime, they win it. A game that Chelsea, there was the goal that made it 3 0, that would have so surely set uh, Chelsea through. It was an offside. It was all top 10 what happened against Manchester City, the best team in the world. And of course, we had Guardiola against um, Real Madrid, which is always a storyline. Let's face it, in Manchester, Real Madrid were lucky to lose 4-3 because City outplayed them large, largely. City held a 1-0 lead going to stoppage time. And Real Madrid scored two stoppage time goals. Where have I heard that one before? Unbelievable, and then they scored a winner in uh, overtime. Again, 
They were maybe not the better team, but they were a team that you had to beat, that always had to believe to come back. It was just unbelievable what Real Madrid did. Yes, there was some luck in there, but I think having the willpower to go through and knowing we are Real Madrid, that is a different story. And all three, they had always played the second leg at home, so the Bernabeu was rocking. And then in the final, yes, Liverpool controlled the early stages of the game, but in the end, Real Madrid then won it by being clinical and Liverpool again missing their chances. Again, Liverpool in all the cup finals that they played didn't score a single goal. Overall, if I think about it, yes, there was some luck involved in all the four stages. Yes, they were eliminated at least three times, but not quite. And that makes, I would argue, this run the most impressive run that we have seen from any European team because they were outsiders four times in a row and won every single time and are your, your European champions. And what I like the most is that it was done under Carlo Angelotti, who had this laid back approach, even conversing with his great players. What shall we do? How should, should, should we approach it? It was really, really impressive. And so I'm very, very happy to say uh, that Angelotti won another Champions League and Real Madrid were again the kings of Europe. How unexciting and still very exciting was that. The fourth entry on this list is unfortunately a sad one and it's the very recent one. I'm shooting this a day after uh, it has been confirmed that Pelé was passing. It's of course the passing of one of the greatest legends of the game in Pelé. I made a whole video on my thoughts on that. Again, he was more than just a great, the, the potentially the greatest player. He was an icon. He was the first global superstar. He put Brazil on the map. He was probably also the first superstar of African descent to make the game. And in addition, he probably has done all the moves that we associate with certain players. He has done them, done, done them first. I will keep it short. Rest in peace, Pelé. The world will miss you. The world will miss your smile. And I think Brazil will have an extended period of mourning. It was not a good start to their, or not a good end to their year overall. I just realized that with the frequent wardrobe changes, I sometimes forget to put on the glasses, <laughs> which makes it an extra fun video. We had staying with the end of the year, just before that we had actually a pretty big tournament happening in November and December, which of course was the World Cup, a tournament that was so entertaining in a way that it gets more than one entry on this list. And I think while it started out relatively slow, although there were a few upsets, named by Japan uh, over Germany, uh, it really kicked into a different gear once the group stage ended. And I have, have to say this was the most entertaining end to any group stage that I've seen. It started out with two head-to-heads between Ecuador and Senegal and then Iran and the United States, which were overall exciting. Anything could have happened. Uh, one more, maybe not the uh, very greatest games. And another head-to-head -head between... Um, Australia and Denmark, however, with the additional twist that if it was a draw and Tunisia win against France, it would have been Tunisia going through. It almost was there, however, Australia scored and right after Tunisia take the, uh, the lead and hold on against the Denmark team. That was a really, really big disappointment overall. However, next level stuff was then achieved in the evening when uh, Poland could have eliminated eventual champions Argentina. However, they did not show up. In effect, Argentina, if they would have played a little bit full and not rested themselves, they could have uh, dealt Poland a really, really bad blow. I was ready on that evening. I said, if Poland qualify, and uh, of course, <laughs> thinking that they will do a good performance if they do so, then I will buy another Poland shirt. They did not deserve that because Mexico, who had also had a horrible tournament, suddenly got the goals in the other game against Saudi Arabia who had been a positive surprise up, up, the, up to the point in the tournament. They quickly got two goals. They were one goal short. You had to count yellow cards because that would have been the tiebreaker till Saudi Arabia scores. Still, one Mexico goal would have seen them through already 
absolute madness. Then we saw Lukaku missing chance after chance after chance against Croatia and Morocco qualifying also thanks to a win uh, through. We already talked about the Moroccan exploits at this World Cup. This was really exciting because uh, Croatia could have been out. They made it into the semifinals. Also, the Morocco game, uh, if Canada has a little bit better goal scoring, could have well gone that Morocco is also out. So it was all in the balance there as well. But I think it hit really fever pitch where Japan played Spain and Germany against Costa Rica. And there was a point where out of this group, Costa Rica and Japan would have made it through. Japan, by the slips of margins, the ball was not over the line, beat a Spain team. That had a comfortable lead. Costa Rica, I think, turned around against Georgia, Germany, if I remember correctly. However, the Germans came back. But Spain basically stopped and said, maybe we'll take the easier route because my drivers play Morocco in the next round. How did that work out for them? That was absolute. This was almost too much to take that on the last day we had um, the big fight Uruguay Ghana for a place in the next round, except that. South Korea beat a B team against Portugal in the last last minute and Uruguay was a goal short. Uruguay got, got limited. Also drama, although for a time it didn't seem like it. And then we had a head to head between Serbia and Switzerland where also Cameroon got the surprise win against Brazil at the end. However, at that point Switzerland had the game more against Serbia wrapped up, although they found themselves after one nil lead 2-1 down. So really, really exciting this end of the group stage. I don't think we will get, I didn't think that we can get anything better during the World Cup. Well, I was proven wrong, although the World Cup was really, really uh, good overall. Not saying it was the greatest, but what happened during that end of the group group stage almost was the best thing that happened at this entire World Cup. And it was definitely the best end to a group stage. And I'm mourning the fact that we're expanding this World Cup because this can only happen for with uh, four teams in each group and there are eight groups because it's very clear the top two go through but yeah i messed up my rundown you usually give the honorable mentions before the top three well this time around i think it actually just does, doesn't do so badly to do it before the final two rounds uh here are some storylines that i did consider but didn't quite make it and staying with with the world cup croatia's run to third place was was again impressive uh, but very real madrid like that wasn't always convincing however the way they played against brazil the fight that they had in them and the resolve they managed to eliminate the brazil team who had taken the lead which has never happened before in overtime uh, that is so uh, that was pretty impressive there they fell f flat against Argentina but then managed a, th a cre very credible third place player and Luka Modric definitely should be considered among the players of the season slightly related to World Cup is another story uh, Italy did not qualify for the World Cup they were also by North Macedonia that is a story that I could not believe. Yes, they probably would have lost to Portugal, but that you didn't even make it to the playoff final. Another Mamma Mia moment for Italy and that right after the year that they had. Uh, another one that I want to mention, we have Freiburg here uh, in the German Bundesliga. The Minos were kind of making a big run. I named Freiburg because they made it to the Europa League relatively easy. They made it to the cup final where they were very, very unlucky to lose on penalties to Leipzig, who uh, claimed their uh, first title. But now they're still very much in the front of the Bundesliga and also uh, doing very well in the Europa League. But there's another team that has to definitely go in there. That's Union Berlin. Longtime league leaders earlier uh, in fall. Really a team that should... Probably many would say should not be in the Bundesliga. However, with great management, a very distinctive, not always pretty style, making it deep and rocking the Bundesliga now for a fourth, I think it's a four, uh, third or fourth season in a row. Unbelievable. Really, this is an unbelievable feat. Makes the Bundesliga a lot more exciting, although we know who is going to win it every year.
But other than that, it's really, really great. We also have to talk about these guys here. Barcelona, what a mess of a club. There's one glaring highlight in that season. That was the 4-0 win at eventual Champions League champions Real Madrid, which was so out of nowhere. Barcelona really hit the ground running. Then came Frankfurt and all fell apart. They still finished with a big season second in the league. They had no money and they made a transfer summer that beggared belief. They lose to Real Madrid. They didn't look good in the league for a while. They were ousted in the Champions League uh, rather handily in the group stage. And they still find themselves against the uh, league leaders. This team is a mess. In a positive or negative sense, financially, I don't know what they're doing. I think they're taking a high stakes gamble. They probably will want to win the Europa League again until they run into an opponent. It is very interesting what's going to happen. Speaking of mess and drama, there are two players that caused a whole lot of drama. Holland's move to City was actually quite smooth. Mbappé staying at PSG, that was not smooth at all. Anything but because he thought he had signed for Real Madrid. And that was the biggest drama in, 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 in the summer. But he stayed with his hometown club because he had Messi and he had Neymar. But that relationship, although they got a new coach and it all seemed to be gelling, then suddenly, around the international break in September, he kind of made say, I don't like the position that I'm playing in. Like a big baby showing up. The one alleviating stance is that, of course, he was then the star of, for France in the, at, at the World Cup, kind of cementing his place that he's probably, together with Haaland, the next big thing. But we have also an aging star in there, in Cristiano Ronaldo, who unfortunately, yes, he had a really, really rough year on a personal level. But in a way, he cannot accept that he's not great anymore. No one wants him at this moment. At this time, we're talking about that he's moving to Saudi Arabia. The one thing that he uh, made sure of is that he is claiming the headlines. In the run-up to the World Cup, which was only one week, there was only one topic, it was Cristiano Ronaldo. He then scores at the World Cup, becoming the first player to score in five consecutive World Cups. He has a record. He has his goal scoring tally. I think he will get the 200 caps for Portugal, uh, which of course are also a world record, of course. So he has, he has gotten a few records. However, his, the last few months have been rather, rather poor for him. And then the, the, Portugal played his best game when he was benched at the beginning and his replacement scored a hat trick. Not a good year. For Cristiano. Of course Cristiano's year was not improved when his eternal arrival went on to carry Argentina to win the World Cup in what surely has been the best World Cup final of all time. Which admittedly World Cup finals not always the greatest games but the drama they had was there it topped the World Cup group stage which is something I could not imagine I even said that after group stage this is where the World Cup re reaches its highlight and while the knockout stage was great it kind of lacked that one game that was hanging on the line where two teams were going at each other until the final and that it was the final just made it all that sweeter Messi, who had never scored in the knockout stage before, actually carried this time Argentina, but he was not, maybe carries the wrong way. He was the cherry on top of a decent team, but he scored the important goals. He always got the, uh, the, the, uh, the go-ahead because he was involved in those. So he was actually quite instrumental in that at the age of 35. Going into the final, however, I thought that France overall looked a much better team and I was gobsmacked and I still don't understand what happened in the first 70 minutes or so for France. Argentina, as in all the knockout stage, uh, stage games, they had a tunnel lead, seemed to be cruising. And then there comes the penalty. Mbappé scores a minute later, brilliant move and I should not forget it was a brilliant move for France that gave Mbappé his second goal and equalized the final in the 82nd minute. A final that was going for Argentina all the way. I wouldn't be remiss to say that the second goal for Argentina, the first one was also a penalty, but the second goal for Argentina was probably even better because it was a total team goal where I think seven Argentinian players were involved in the build-up. It was a brilliant piece of football. 
Argentina take the lead again in overtime. You thought it's done. Another penalty given. France equalize. But then, in the last minute of the game, it went all crazy when Colo Muani missed the sitter and then on the other side, Lautaro Martinez does the same for Argentina. This was a game, I love penalty shootouts, this was a game where I really regretted to, that this went to a penalty shootout. Not because I knew that Argentina have a clear advantage, because I felt that this is a game that should have been decided on the pitch right there and then. But... Afterwards, I mean, the emotions in there, this was probably uh, this. Emotionally, I was drained from two teams that, yes, I care about both of these teams, but it's not that this was kind of, uh, I, I was definitely more nervous when Italy played last year in the Euros. Uh, there, I just wanted to have a great game. And yes, I was slightly more for France in the, in the game, but I was emotionally drained. For over a day, I had needed some time for me to find it. It was an absolutely amazing final. An amazing final. This is the rarest of things that you ever get. And this is something that has to be truly appreciated, I gotta say. And I was so happy that I could see this one and I, that my family could see this one. Because, you know, my girls, they got also very much into that. This was nail-biting stuff. And they could experience that. That actually put the chair on top. But what could top this, the greatest World Cup final ever, Messi's crowning achievement? Well, if you have a view of my channel, you know there could have been only one choice. Milan winning the Serie A title in the most amazing fashion. For around three to four weeks, late April, early May, I was a nervous wreck. I literally was a nervous wreck. This was the World Cup final extended to an entire month. Yes, <laughs> life gets in between, so you have some moments where you calm down. But it was for me not a foregone conclusion. Inter just seemed too strong most of the time. However, Milan found another gear with a team that was definitely not the strongest one. First, Napoli fall away. As they typically tend to do, Milan getting big wins at Napoli, for instance, uh, to get them closer. And then this one evening where I didn't want to watch. I think I watched, uh, it, it was a Champions League night. I know Inter always had this make-up game against Bologna in hand. Where, so whenever Milan was still in front, I thought no, it doesn't count because uh, Inter is going to destroy Bologna relatively easy. Uh, Kudos to Serie A for not giving those three points to Inter because that would have decided the title. And it was just before that Bologna game that Milan had probably the biggest, and I hope I'm getting this right now, Milan were about to lose to Lazio, a game that they had to go ahead. And then with the last minute Tonali goal, they get the win that galvanized the fan base and everyone this is because Milan had it, I, I remember making even a video say it's so frustrating to watch Milan this nil nil at the Turin they cannot score goals that game against Lazio gave Milan the boost and then it was clear they need to win out or they can drop one because Bologna not only drew against Inter a draw would have, would, have, would, have, would have been enough because Milan would have held a tiebreaker or uh, in because they won the derby which was Another great moment this year when Milan won this derby thanks to two Giroud goals at derby. They had no business of winning. Let's face it. It's the sweetest derby win that I can ever remember. And I count the 6 nil and the 5 nils in there. This was the sweetest derby win ever. Because Inter outplayed them but didn't kill them off. And Giroud, my, as I like to call him, my second favorite Frenchman of all time, uh, scored a brace gave uh, Milan an important win. But you still, it, with all the frailties that Inter showed, it, it, it was a way too emotional team. Milan was also not great until they became great when Bologna won this game because at that moment Milan could actually drop points as well. And then it was only four games left. And against Fiorentina, yes, you could afford a draw, but not in the first game because that would have taken out all the momentum. Very late on, they get the goal. Such a relief. And then it went relatively easy. There was a game in Verona where they found they had to fight again Tonali coming uh, through. 
but ahead of the last match day, uh, it was pretty clear if Milan win at Sassuolo, it is all done. There was also the game against Atalanta, the second to last uh, that I have to mention with Theo Hernandez scoring a coast to coast goal. Brilliant. I was buzzing, but you know, it was always. <sighs> I'm not sure if they can make it. I'm not sure if they can make it. And I know Sassuolo has been a team that uh, has been a thorn in their side for most uh, of the time. However, in Sassuolo, or in Reggio Emilia, I should say, Milan have performing really, really well. And then you saw it. The game, the stadium in Reggio Emilia was full with Milan fans. The greatest away day of the entire year. And yes, I'm counting the Argentina fans at the World Cup. All of Milan descended on that one pitch, more or less. And while I was nervous, my nerves were eased because at halftime Milan led 3 0. Giroud founding the breakthrough, uh, and Im Kessie scored the goal. Uh, it was just wonderful. It actually allowed me the second half to calm down because I told everyone I will be a wreck through that game. I was not. When it was 3 0, I said, okay, that's it. And at the same time, there was also the uh, EPL decider, which did not help matters because I would have loved to see both. I stayed with Milan because that's the more important for me, bar none. Milan winning a title. The only sour point at that day is that Slatan's goal did not count for an offside because he would have deserved it. Because it's because of Slatan in the end that Milan came back to the top of the league. This was my moment of the year. Milan winning that Scudetto with the celebrations afterwards it was just brilliant it was brilliant it made my year i'm still so proud of them um it might be a fight to repeat the title as long as inter don't win it i'm fine i'm fine because that one they're both now 19 i want milan to win the 20th before inter that's now the goal so yeah, those are my big moments for the year. Uh, what are your moments? Please leave a line below. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my uh, channel if you want to see more videos like this. I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you might enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.